Hello and happy Easter, everyone. Let's uh, celebrate the story of Jesus' resurrection as we read it from the Gospel according to Mark, and then I'll offer you a few thoughts about the story. From the 16th chapter, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They were afraid, is the way Mark's gospel tells the story. Afraid. And that's it. The ending of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, when we read it from Mark, we, we wonder, what happened to Jesus in the garden, calling Mary's name? What happened to running off and telling the disciples, who they knew wouldn't believe them anyway? What happened to the charbroiled fish on the lake shore? And, and about Jesus Peter... Jesus telling Peter to, to feed his lambs, tend his sheep, feed his sheep. And, and what about the road to Emmaus? And, and the Thomas incident, I mean, of all the ways to end the story that begins with, uh, the shep with angels telling the shepherds, fear not, I, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. Of all the different endings you could choose, this one comes up pretty short. Maybe something's missing. Lots of New Testament scholars think so but not all of them. So whether or not there's some secret half a page that got ripped off a scroll somewhere, I'm going with this version because it seems true. True in the sense that, yeah, what those women did is exactly what I might have done if I'd been there. True to life. Authentic. Real. They were afraid. Well, who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? We're always afraid of an unknown tomorrow. Aside from the fact that the women had gone to, to where they saw Jesus being buried and the stone was rolled away and Jesus wasn't even there, but a young man in a white robe was, aside from how astonishing all of that would have been by itself, they had to have been afraid about what this might mean. What are the implications of this? We'll start with a stone. Stones just don't roll themselves, <laughs> do they? Somebody had to have done that. Didn't, didn't the text say that, that the, the women said, who will roll away the stone from the door for us? Stones just don't roll themselves, and that's the way life is. Things don't just happen. You have to make them happen. You have to be an agent of your own destiny. Carve out whatever niche you have in life and get things done. Nobody's giving you a free lunch, buddy. Take the bulls by the horn. Am I right? But you know what? The stone was done rolled away. By whom? By the kid in the robe? Not likely. Or was something bigger going on? Could something bigger be going on? Could it be that God is at work in this world, moving stones around, opening doors, dropping little packages of grace, making things happen that we didn't give God permission to do and we didn't even ask God to do? Could it be that God is God and not us? 
if that's so, if, if there really are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, then well, wouldn't that shake you up? Who knows what possibilities might open if science doesn't account for every single thing in this world? This is unknown territory. Doesn't it make you afraid? And I think of another aspect of the story. These, these women were, well, they were women of their time, and there were certain aspects of life that were just unquestionable. Unquestionable because they were indisputably true. For example, as much as they may have wished for things to be different for them, women were valued for their relationship to men. Whatever value they were given, and you see that's the point, isn't it? They had to have value given to them. Anyway, whatever value was given to them, it came from being the wives of upstanding men or the mothers of bright little boys. But then for as long as they had known Jesus, he, he seemed to break the rules. He, he didn't allow men to just toss women off like trash. He, he looked them in the eye and, and talked with them scandalously in the middle of the day and in the middle of the town square where everyone could see. And here and in every one of the Gospels, women are the first witnesses, the first to see, and in the other Gospels, the first to say, the first to preach, the first the first to tell anyone that death couldn't hold Jesus' body down. Could it be that Jesus is redefining reality for these women and for the world? Could it be that they didn't have to see themselves a second class anymore? This was new territory, and as invigorating as it might be, it's also frightening because it's new, it's unknown. And then, well, you know, look, there's the big one, of course, uh, that, that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, the, the one they, they all knew and everybody knew and everybody knows is bedrock bottom truth. Stories have beginnings and middles and ends and people are born and live and die. And that's that. And you know, the sooner you reconcile yourself to death, the happier you'll be. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. In the meantime, you love whom you love, but you can't hold them forever. If fortune smiles on you, either you get to say goodbye to them when they die, or they get to say goodbye to you. But it's not a very wide range of choices here. And then there stands this lad in a in a shadowy tomb and, and, and says, he's risen. I know you're looking for your dead friend, but he's not here. He is risen. Well, no, <laughs> that's fantasy. That's, that, that's delusion. That's wishful thinking, right? What if it's true? Are you not afraid? I am, because, because if it's true, then the story isn't over yet. The story of Jesus rising from the dead, appearing to these women and to Peter and the other friends, <coughs> excuse me, and then to 500 and on and on, perhaps not appearing the way we appear when we put on our Easter Sunday best and walk into church, but, but appearing nonetheless, appearing in lives brought back from from shame and self-hatred into pride, appearing in, in relationships brought back from the long dead, appearing in movements of, of, of freedom and equality for all. Jesus appears in, in processes of truth and reconciliation in nations where the only way forward seemed to be a bloodbath. The story continues. That's the point of it. The story of Christ rising from the dead is a living story, not a dead old tale. The thing is, it dawns on us 
it dawns on us as it dawned on the women slowly at first, but as you go, uh, the more you think of it, the more you let it sink in and imagine what it could mean for you. You bet this story causes you to tremble, tremble. Because in the last analysis, the story of Jesus isn't a tragedy that ends on Good Friday or the story of the victory of a hero that ends on Easter Sunday. It is an unending story, a story that is a challenge, a challenge to you and to me, a story that says that so much of what we thought we knew about life is just wrong. You see, we are who God says we are, which has nothing to do with, with, with what we look like or how we speak or what our IQ is or whom we love or what our genitals are or how much money we have or any such thing. We are the beloved of God made in God's image. God is alive and well and at work in places beyond anything that we ask or imagine. God is at work in this world without our permission and beyond our request. Life is stronger than death. And I remind you in this story, the power of evil has been defeated. Does it show up? You bet it does. Of course it does. But it's over, folks. We're in mop-up operations now. Life is indeed stronger than death. Let that dawn on you this Easter of 2022. Let it shake you up. Let it make you afraid because that's a good fear. That's a good fear right there. Fear that's that what's too good to be true is true after all, that Christ is risen. So, you tell me, are you going to stay stuck in your fear? Or are you going to follow? That's your decision. It's your decision. But only one way leads to life. That's the message for Easter this year. May you, on this day and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, choose life. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. See you next week.